afternoon and welcome to the 2023 edition of our Law Day ceremonies here, excuse me, in Lycoming County. Um, the Law Association has a wonderful committee that runs the Law Day events, so I'm going to turn it over to the chairman of that committee, Magisterial District Judge Christian Fry. Thank you. Okay, uh, good afternoon. First and foremost, uh, I'd like to again uh, welcome everybody to this year's Law Day celebration here in Lecoming County. And uh, I'd like to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. So if everybody would stand up, please, and we have the flag here uh, the fire. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Our uh, county commissioners uh, have always been very supportive of uh, this event in particular, uh, and I believe uh, we have all three of them here today to present a proclamation uh, designating today as Law Day. So, Commissioner, come up. This is my last year as far as being a county commissioner, and this was always one of the best days of the year, and for a number of reasons. You know, today, our, our politics seems to be really messed up, right? We can all agree with that, but the foundation of our country lies right here. Right here, we still have, we still have a system that works. And you know, what I hear more often than not anymore is, geez, you know, our country is really bad. Our kids aren't there. Well, you know what? They don't come to this meeting. Because when I see what you, you children and you young adults create and talk about, we have a promising future here in this country. And they don't just get that you know, because they're intelligent. They get it because they have very good parents and grandparents and people that love them. So I'm going to miss this in the future, but I can't wait to hear from everybody here in, in the next half hour or so. So likewise, I'm really excited for the young kids here today. Um, can maybe anyone who's under the age of 16 could stand up? Well, there are lots of you here. I have a feeling maybe I should have said 17. But anyway, um, the point is that what Commissioner Masser said is really true. You, you all are the future of the country. And I hope that you'll look here, and you'll look here, and you'll look at all the people in the law offices here and in the courts and say, geez, maybe one day that'll be me. Maybe one day I'll be a judge. Maybe one day I'll be a prosecutor. Maybe one day I'll be a defense attorney. Or maybe one day I'll do any of the things in the court. Because if you open your hearts and your minds to that and you listen to what they say, I think you'll find that there's a lot of excitement in being able to learn, learn about our society, learn about other people and how they live and sometimes reflect on all the blessings that you've been able to get in your life and see how you can take those blessings and turn them into doing something positive. At the end of the day, the country's been around 250 years, or I don't know the exact number. Close to, I should, three. Close to three. I should know that. But the truth is, it's all because of kids like you who grew up and did all the things that you see people doing today. So I'm excited. I'm optimistic. Uh, I'm excited to see what you've brought to us today. It looks like some of it is edible. Um, <laughs> But in any event, thank you. Thank you to the parents, as Commissioner Masser said. None of it happens. Communities don't spontaneously develop and stay strong just on their own. It's because people love the people that they're with, right? To the kids here, you have grandparents here. I talked to one couple that's up here from Florida. I mean, people are here. They're excited about you. They're excited about what you're going to contribute. So it's out of that love that communities stay strong, and hopefully we find a way to build something to pass on to others what was passed on to us. Welcome to Law Day, and we're excited to have you. And you can have a seat. 
Uh, very briefly, this, this day is very exciting because it is about our youth. It is about tomorrow. And uh, we're going to be coming up upon the end of the school year with graduations. I have a daughter who's being, going to be graduating in June. And I see the excitement and um, anticipation and at the same time a little bit of anxiety about her future, what she's going to be able to do in society and, and make, a, make a mark in her, her role in it. Um, so we love hearing the creativity. I always enjoy looking at the artwork and reading the essays because that is our tomorrow. That's our future. And uh, the creativity that's put into those is, is incredible. I, I worked in the criminal justice system for 32 years. So I was in this courtroom on, a, on basically a daily basis. And working aside attorneys and law enforcement and the, the, the judges, I worked under uh, 12 different judges. And to, to see the whole system come to a, to a whole, to work together so that we kept peace, justice, because without law, we do not have order in our society. So it's very important that we do have laws, we do have rules, and that we make, make sure that rights are not violated. And at the same time, everybody's uh, given their constitutional rights and they're adhered to. And that's part of the law process. So we want to thank everybody for being here. We're excited to hear the winners, what's taking place. But this is a great day that we look forward to every year because it's, it's something that uh, that we're very, very behind as commissioners. So with that, we'll read a proclamation. Proclamation for Lycoming County Law Day. Whereas Law Day first held in 1958, was established in the United States, and it exemplifies the merits of our court system. And whereas Law Day affords citizens the opportunity to reflect on our county's judicial system, a system that provides a forum for the peaceable resolution of disputes among citizens permits citizens to obtain identification of their grievances, even grievances against the government itself, and provides extensive protection of the defendant to protect against the possibility of unjust imprisonment by an overzealous government, a system which seems preferable to an unchecked government which cannot be held to account. And whereas Law Day is observed in our community with activities which include honoring our Law Day essay and our winners, presentation by local government officials and judicial representatives, and celebration of our court system. Now, therefore, the Board of, the Board of Commissioners of the County of Lycoming proclaim Wednesday, May 12, 2023 as Law Day in the County of Lycoming and encourage citizens to recognize the advantages of our judicial system and to support all those who are intricately involved in our court system and who strive for justice for all. Whereas we have set our hands to seal this day, May 12th, 2023, Lycoming like County Commissioner Scott L. Masker, Chairman, Tony R. Massar, Vice Chairman, and Richard Marabito, Secretary. Thank you. Commissioner Massera, we're going to grab a quick photo. You don't need the campaign. So we're going to go. <laughs> Um, I've got the bailiff's head in the background. I don't know if he would mind maybe picking a different seat in the room. Otherwise, he'll be in every single picture. Okay. <laughs> That's almost better. Okay, one more, guys. Very nice. Thank you. All right, um, before we get to uh, our, why we're all here, which is uh, to see and hear our uh, Law Day winners today, uh, I would like to just take a moment to thank the committee, um, because the Law Day committee does a, an incredible amount of work on the front end of this, as you might imagine, and, um, and certainly it's something that takes the efforts of, of many. And so to that end, um, I would like to thank um, Judge Arbuckle, who I guess did not join us. He's not able to be here. Um, Judge Carlucci, Judge Dieter. We have um, Attorney John Petrovito, we did see. Don Martino, Tammy Taylor, Alexandra Shawley, Jennifer Lynn, 
Amanda Gaynor, Tim Wright, Elizabeth White, Nicole Slyke, Michaela Hertog, and then additionally, Jerry Rook, Stephanie Tempesco, Pam Toski, Jasmine Silver, and Devin Zaludic. And uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't also thank Michelle Fry, who is the executive director of the Law Association and um, frankly does most of this work. So um, I'd like to just thank everybody. <laughs> This year's Law Day theme uh, is Cornerstones of Democracy, Civics, Civility, and Collaboration. And what we do is we have an essay contest and an art contest. So for the essay contest, we break it down into two age groups. The, the younger group is kindergarten through fifth grade, the older group sixth through twelfth. For both groups, we had two questions or prompts that we offered. The first being, explain what individual Americans can do to strengthen the cornerstones of democracy. And the second, if civics, civility, and collaboration are three cornerstones of democracy, identify the fourth cornerstone. So those two prompts were offered to all students. And then for the younger group, we also had a specific prompt, which is, what is the role of education and your teacher in making a successful democracy? And for the older group, how does the media promote or inhibit civility in our society? And then for the art category, any art at all, which falls under the theme of cornerstones of democracy, was welcome. So you'll see all kinds of things today. We have poems, drawings, songs, it should be an entertaining afternoon, for sure. <laughs> so with that, I would like to, um, oh, one last thing. It came to my attention that this week is uh, Teacher Appreciation Week. Seems rather fitting um, that while they got pushed back a little bit and it happens to fall uh, here during Teacher Appreciation Week. So to that end, initially, um, I, I, I can't emphasize enough the importance of the teachers in getting everybody here, right? Because we send our request for Law Day entries out to the teachers. And from there, we get back entries. That's all the teacher's doing. Um, and so, let's just give it a, a round of applause. Appreciate it. And I would like to also at least uh, welcome or invite uh, any teachers who are here to come up with their student when they present, if, if you feel comfortable or would like to do that. So, to that end, we have our first uh, art winner is Carly Browse from Loyal Sock Middle School. Carly All right. Do you want to tell everybody, maybe stand up here just so everybody can see and tell everybody a little about your art. So for oh, my yeah, artwork, I kind of took it into consideration like it would be an Instagram post, so on social media. So as the fourth cornerstone of democracy, I identified, I identified compassion and co civic civility and collaboration. If I were to add a fourth cornerstone, it would be compassion. You have to have to care for others to vote for the best solution for your country. So then, also in my artwork, I wanted to make everything have its own little meaning, like a little Easter egg. So the time is 8.02, because the Declaration of Independence was signed on August 8th, I mean, August, August 2nd, there it is, and then in 1776, so that's in the username, Independence Hall, Philadelphia, is where it was signed, and then, Liked by Ben Frankie and 54 others. <laughs> um, and then I put hashtags at the bottom. Hashtag three cornerstones. Hashtag plus one. Hashtag democracy. <laughs> Certificate and a check for you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Well done. Congratulations. <laughs> Okay, next we have Lila Butters, also from Loyal Sock Middle School. And I believe Lila is our song. 
Do you need anything? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Because we have to show the four cornerstones and ideas civility, civics, and then collaboration and conduct. Um, and so, um, conduct is the act of having manners and respect for everything and everyone. Collaboration is the act of working together to create or produce something. Civility is the politeness and courtesy you have you use in speech and behaviors, and civics is the study of privileges and obligations we have as citizens. I thought like the conduct was really important to have because you use that in your everyday life. And I'm told, and maybe Isabel, you want to confirm this, I'm told that this is an edible entry. Yes, uh, after we can eat the music. <laughs> <laughs> you may want to stick around for that. <laughs> All right, uh, next up, Benjamin Turry, who wrote a poem. Three cornerstones, I need to think of one more. What will be number four? Civic, civility, and collaboration. What will you do with such information? Uh, civics, the rights and duties of citizenship. Civility, politeness and respect. Collaboration, working with others. What else would you expect? The world is full of sadness and despair. Would harmony make it all fair? It would be nice to have more understanding and even fewer demanding. Concord. Concord. Agreement or harmony between people or groups. The three cornerstones can't stand alone. Democracy can't be strengthened on its own. Living in Concord, Americans can accomplish more. Concord is what you should be looking for. Without Concord, our democracy can fall apart at the seams. Could you tell me what that means? Students should know about Concord. Teachers should be able to get them on board. A successful democracy shall be the reward. Woo. Thank you. Okay, um, and then 
our last art winner uh, was not able to join us today. Um, it was actually Catherine Nicholas who uh, drew something for us, I guess. Um, but we do have somebody here to accept on her behalf, and uh, I guess with a message or some words from uh, our winner. So, uh, Lily Spawnhouse, correct? Mm -hmm. Come on up. This is what Catherine wanted me to say. Um, <laughs> firstly, I would like to thank the Lycoming Law Association for this award, and I am truly grateful that this opportunity was presented to me by my art teacher, Dr. McDonough. I wish I could be here to meet you all and thank you in person, but sadly, I am out of town seeing my sister graduate from college. With this painting, I wanted to convey a group of Americans with all very different lives, yet all brought together through the, their collective experience as American citizens. Acknowledging our diversity is vital to maintaining a democracy. A medical worker is on a very different path than a young adult entering the workforce. A teacher has faced different struggles than an industrial worker. We each lead our own lives and we walk along our own paths. For the process of this painting, I thought about painting different hands or different faces, but I finally chose to paint shoes. I wanted to express the importance of individual paths taken by Americans, and I knew that shoes would allow me to display this. I decided to paint the shoes of a medical worker, a young child, an entrepreneur, a teacher, an industrial worker, and a young adult. This painting felt more like six paintings put together, and I worked at each shoe bit by bit. It gave me the chance to give each pair of shoes its own character to show that they had been worn in by the American that wore them. Overall, it was a great experience making this painting, and I am very happy that it was received well. Thank you all again. So we can move on to our essay winner, and the first up is Jack Cassidy from St. John Newman. You can stand behind the podium or in front. Okay. What is the role of writing education in my teacher in, in my teacher in making a successful government? I think it is teaching social skills, how to take care of responsibilities, and having expectations. These are what teachers should be teaching us to do in making a successful, successful government. In making a successful government, I think that the teacher should teach us social, social skills. In, in a government, you normally have to talk to people to sort our problems. A teacher should also teach about having responsibilities. In a government, having responsibilities is super important. If you don't follow your, your responsibilities, you will get fired. Nothing will be done. Finally, I think that a teacher should teach us to have expectations. I think that teachers should teach, us, teach their students to have expectations because in a successful government, having expectations is a big deal. If you don't have expectations, no one would ever get anything done. Those reasons are why I think that teachers should teach us to to have social skills for talking to others respectfully. Also, to have responsibilities so that we can get the things done that we need to do. Lastly, to have expectations for the workers to get the job done. St. John Newman. Education and your teacher are essential in making a successful government. There are eight social skills that children need to know to be positive role models in the classroom and in their community. The eight social skills are sharing, listening, following directions, collaborating, and cooperating, patience, empathy, respecting boundaries, and positivity. Teachers must understand each student individually and what they need to work to their full potential. A teacher who shows kindness and makes the student feel comfortable will positively influence how a student behaves. The student will want to be successful and take pride in the eight social skills their teacher instills in them. Now, how does this relate to government? The social skills you need to know as a child go hand in hand with the social skills 
you need as an adult to succeed in the workplace. These workplace social skills are communication, organization, critical thinking, active listening, self-care, cultural awareness, patience, and understanding. For example, to be a representative in Congress, you need to have patience to wait your turn to speak to your fellow members of Congress. As a judge, you must have critical thinking skills to be impartial when listening to a case representing the plaintiff and the defendant. These skills are crucial to having a successful government. These same skills are imperative for the people of the United States to abide by to have a functioning and safe democracy. Education and my teacher play an essential role in making a successful government. Gwendolyn Isley from Jersey Shore. The fourth cornerstone of democracy. The cornerstones of democracy are civics, civility, and collaboration. These three cornerstones of democracy are things that we need to support our country but a fourth cornerstone would make our democracy even more stable. The fourth cornerstone would be, in my opinion, the Constitution. The Constitution would be the fourth cornerstone of democracy because it was written for the people, by the people. Our founding fathers helped with writing it. The for the people part displays the civics part, and the by the people part illustrates the collaboration that they used to write the Constitution. To collaborate effectively, they needed to do it civilly. This shows that the Constitution was made to be a plan for how the United States would work. The Constitution helps to protect, pe protect people's freedoms and rights. The First Amendment protects our ability to have free speech, freedom of religion, and assemble peacefully. The Fourth Amendment protects our right to be secure in our homes. The Sixth Amendment protects our right to have a fair trial. Our country's laws are supposed to support the Constitution and how it works. This shows the importance of the Constitution. In conclusion, I think that the Constitution would be an appropriate fourth cornerstone of, demo of democracy, considering the reasons above. Um, next up, Olivia Regan. According to a study performed by Pew Research Center in 2022, 6 in 10 U.S. adults are unsatisfied with the way democracy has been functioning in America, and 85% agree that the U.S. political system either needs major changes or complete reformation. The data indicates that citizens believe the structure of democracy is to blame for a failing democratic system, but Americans rarely consider the root, to be, the root cause to be themselves. For example, NPR News reported that only 67% of eligible voters voted in the 2020 presidential election, demonstrating how U.S. citizens are failing to act upon the cornerstones of democracy, of civics, civility, and collaboration. Democracy fails when Americans are reluctant to abide to these three cornerstones. The most, the most approachable stance to prevent U.S. citizens from abandoning these fundamental standards is to stress how vital proper communication is in democracy. Its, imp its importance is so crucial that it deserves to be recognized as a fourth cornerstone, and, when utilized correctly, would improve the democratic relationship between the people and the government. Although civic civility and collaboration are strong cornerstones in solidarity, an additional cornerstone of communication would greatly reinforce the existing democratic qualities. In order for any cornerstone to prosper, the three others must be present. For each of the cornerstones, both support and depend on one another. Communication properly demonstrates this ability with both civics and collaboration. With the help of major communication outlets, or mass media, Americans can effectively execute their civic duties by participating in democratic processes, respecting and obeying the law, staying informed, participating in local community events, paying taxes, and serving on jury. 
televised news station, newspapers, radio, broadcasts, and other forms of mass media are great sources of information to assist citizens in executing these duties, especially concerning staying informed. This is an essential responsibility for U.S. citizens because it helps them vote honestly, acknowledge events in the, happening in the world around them, and make educated decisions. Additionally, utilizing an accurate, an accurate, reliable, and honest source of, source of mass media is just as important as any other civic obligation in the United States. It can be difficult to identify undependable media. Therefore, Americans should be careful in which sources they trust. Accessing valid communication allows citizens to participate in an array of civic duties. Likewise, successful collaboration requires respect, reliability, and most importantly, communication. Whether it be a local problem or nationwide dilemma, discussion is necessary to reach a solution. In, re in recent years, political division has become much more prevalent. For instance, a physical and threatening exchange occurred between Republican congressmen during what should have been a respectful election process. Furthermore, the war between Democrats and Republicans has expanded beyond f peaceful protests into genuine violence, turning common Americans against each other. Proper collab collaboration will allow Americans to overcome these differences and become further united, preventing these aggressive altercations. Learning to compromise, empath empathize, and understand other perspectives will ultimately create a safe and respectful environment in which different political parties can collaborate. Accom accomplishing appropriate collaboration amongst American citizens would be vain, though, without the use of communication, since the democratic cornerstones rely on each other so greatly. In contradiction, though, strong evidence suggests that certain communication sources, particularly social media, are in fact promoting a lack of civility in Americans. A second study done by Pew Research Center in 2022 shows 69% of U.S. adults agree that social media has made people less civil in the way they talk about politics. This could be caused, caused partly by certain features providing anon anonymity <laughs> to users. It can be difficult to identify a user who provides no personal information. So social media users feel they can safely use rude or threatening dialogue online and receive no repercussions. As a result, social media has become a support system for harsh debates, chaotic arguments, and disrespectful behavior. Even so, it is important to address that no institution can succeed, can succeed without the presence of every cornerstone. For each, for each one both aids and relies on the presence of one another. Any form of democracy would, in theory, collapse without the company of all four. This reality has unfolded regarding social media, where users are neglecting the standards of all cornerstones. As stated before, mass media is being abused, with, un with untrustworthy sites relaying faulty information, preventing citizens from accomplishing their civic responsibilities. Along with this, politicians are losing touch with the idea of collaboration and are resorting to stubbornness rather than compromise. If Americans can return to practicing adequate communication, a better functioning democracy may, li may lie on the horizon. Not only this, but U.S. citizens could prevent democratic downfall by practicing all four cornerstones of democracy, civics, civility, collaboration, and communication. By respecting others, working together, fulfilling responsibilities, and communicating efficiently, Americans can improve both their society and country. from Loyal Sox High School. And um, I will note that Luke was a prior winner here in 2018 and 19. Good afternoon, y'all. <clears throat> Henry David Thoreau implores us to think of the government as a machine, one that is able to organize projects and provide liberties, liberties that no other force could but also one that can get ahead of itself. One that becomes deaf to the wishes of the people and creates its own goals to work for. At this point, when the traditional cornerstones of democracy become toothless, Thoreau advocates for another process he believes is equally essential to democracy, civil disobedience. Thoreau's claim is far from an outlandish one. It is instead well-rooted in American history. The Boston Tea Party comes to mind as an early example. In response to the Taxation Without Representation of the Tea Acts, the colonists threw 92,000 pounds of tea into the Boston Harbor. 
The foundational importance of civil disobedience does not end there, though. As the dust of the revolution settled, the founding fathers struggled to reconcile that a nation born in rebellion would now have to govern. Thomas Jefferson was keenly aware of the ironic turn that this could take and expounded at length on the right of Americans to rebel against their government. Harris G. Merkin, a professor of politics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, writes, Jefferson thought of rebellion as an element enforcing a moral decision rather than a weapon designed to conquer. Rebellion had a juridical role, and the rebels were, in effect, presenting their case to the remainder of society, which Jefferson envisioned as a vast court. Thus, action against the government was cemented as an integral part of the American democratic tradition. When Thoreau wrote his famous polemic on dis civil disobedience, many people, Thoreau included, were reviled by the horrors of slavery and the irrational and violence of imperialism in the Mexican-American War. These issues faded from the forefront, but Thoreau's emotional conviction against being complicit in government injustice would carry on when a young Martin Luther King read his essay. With King, the importance of civil disobedience as a democratic process was made plainly clear. Without the power to vote, King still managed to make the voices of millions of Americans heard in their fight against the injustices of institutional racism. The protests and marches of the 1960s civil rights movement improved the functionality of American democracy, stopping the machine and changing its course before it ran towards destruction, as it had when America stood divided. Civics, civility, and collaboration have given America many of its strengths. They have given America the strength and prosperity that it enjoys in the modern day. But these three cornerstones can find themselves used in the name of unjust majority rule, a 51% seeking to terrorize a 49%. When the machine runs on in spite of the wounds it inflicts, Thoreau gives us the advice, cast your whole vote, not a strip of paper merely, but your whole influence. A minority is powerless while it conforms to the majority. It is not even a minority then, but is irresistible when it clogs by its whole weight. Thank you. our grand prize essay winner, um, who is uh, likewise a, a prior winner in, in uh, prior years, uh, 2016, 17, and 18. And so um, I'd like to just uh, mention one other thing, I guess, about because we've kind of adopted Emma as our own here at the <laughs> Law Association. Um, Emma Strickland is uh, our grand prize winner. And I just wanted to, to note something here. Um, Emma has had a very successful uh, school career. Emma is a 4.0 student. She plays soccer, runs track and field, plays in the band, participates in numerous academic clubs, and is a community volunteer, not to mention now a four-time Law Day winner. So Emma, you want to come on up? give my speech today, I would just like to thank the Lycoming Law Association um, for hosting this annual event and uh, District Attorney Gardner's office um, for their support with this. Um, the Laude Essay Contest has been one of my greatest learning experiences and has shaped my future educational goals. So for anyone working in school districts, I highly encourage you to incorporate this into your education so that all students can have the same great experience that I have for all of these years. So for my final Law Day essay presentation. <laughs> the media is not just important. It is critical to the success of our democracy. MediaEngagement.org describes media as the fourth pillar of democracy, along with judiciary, executive, and legislature, whose role is to act against the injustice, oppression, misdeeds, and partiality of our society, and act as a watchdog to protect public interests against malpractice through public awareness. But it is clear that public trust in the media is near an all-time low. 
A 2022 Gallup poll showed that only 34% of Americans trust the media to report news fully, accurately, and fairly. And only 7% have a great deal of trust and confidence. This is just two points higher than the lowest ever rating, which came during the 2016 presidential campaign. While it may be easy for some to blame these feelings on recent political issues, such as gun control, school shootings, vaccinations, critical race theory, book banning, overturning Roe v. Wade, etc., the reality is, is that trust in the media has been slipping since 1976. 1976 happened to be the first presidential election year after the Watergate investigation that was prominently played out in the Washington Post and other newspapers. I do believe that much of this distrust in the media has been exacerbated more recently by the widespread incivility we are seeing in the media, prominently on television, through talk radio, and online via social media. The purpose of media, according to a recent article in Medium, is best defined by the roles they play in society, to educate, inform, and entertain through news, features, and analysis in the press. However, not all media lives up to this calling and some actively work against it. From my perspective, these media outlets promote incivility and have sacrificed education and information for revenue and viewership. It is no wonder that the media feeds into a cycle of incivility by using the aggressive promotion of counter viewpoints through disrespectful arguments, posts, or commentary that are incendiary and mean-spirited and opportunities for anonymous comments or responses. It is important, though, to understand that while the media plays a hand in the civility of our society, the citizenry is equally as responsible. The media is simultaneously a role model for and mirror to our society. As media becomes less civil, that prompts viewers to be less civil, then the media coverage of our society appears even less civil and it continues in this vicious cycle. Trust and incivility seem to have an inversely proportional relationship. As trust in the media goes down, incivility within the media seems to be increasing. I saw this spiral play out firsthand in the school board meetings in my district. While the mainstream media seemed consistent in reporting the potential impact of COVID-19, the growing transmission rates, the health implications, and the benefits of masking, there emerged a clear lack of trust in what the media was saying. And this distrust was often fueled by other media outlets. At one of these meetings, I heard the mother of a child with a chronic disease sobbing at a podium, begging the administration to keep her family safe. The next father to speak began with, I don't care about any other children in the school district except my own. Neighbors were yelling at one another and people called our elected officials un-American and compared them with the Nazi Gestapo. Watching this unfold solidified for me how a lack of trust in the media can lead to increased incivility. I could tell these people were not acting this way on their own. They were mimicking phrases and statements they heard through the media. I watched a health and safety issue unfold into a vitriolic political one fueled by segments of the media. It is human nature that we favor information that confirms our existing beliefs. This confirmation bias leads us to believe everything we see or hear that validates our pre-existing beliefs and opinions and to distrust anyone or anything that challenges these prejudices. At no time in my research did I read that the purpose of media was to tell us what we wanted to hear. When thinking about the cornerstones of our democracy, civics, civility, and collaboration, I kept thinking that consideration would be a great fourth cornerstone. It is defined as careful thought, typically over a period of time, deliberation, thoughtfulness for other people, consideration before acting. How much more civil would both our media and society be with more consideration? In order for our democracy to survive and thrive, media needs to fulfill their original intent and promote civil discourse but it is unrealistic that all media outlets will take the high road. So it is also important that citizens need to seek out reliable media sources to understand all legitimate facets of an issue. When the public begins to trust common news outlets as a reliable source of information that prevents valid disagreements civilly, 
Only then will our country be able to come together to work towards a common goal of bettering our democracy. Thank you. Is District Attorney Gardner here? He's not here. He's not here. Okay, well then. But I'll, he's aware. Yeah, well then I'll, <laughs> I'll do the honors. Do you want to close this? Um, you have two assistant DAs here in the courtroom, if that would help. They're welcome to join us. <laughs> 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 do you want to take credit for that? Yeah. I, yeah. So, representative from the District Attorney's Office. Um, this year, uh, District Attorney Ryan Gardner. Uh, made available um, a, a slightly larger prize than we typically hand out, and uh, we utilized that this year for our grand prize winner, which was Ms. Strickland. And so to that end, I'd like to present Emma Strickland with a check for $1,000. Concludes our presentations from our uh, winners. Uh, I'd like to take an opportunity now to um, give our judges uh, a chance to make any comments that they um, find appropriate. Judge Anderson is our senior judge here today, and I wanted, if you would like to say a few words. Sure. Um, thank you all. Um, I, I always feel compelled um, when I make my remarks at Law Day <laughs> to give a little bit of a historical review of Law Day because I think it's so interesting. Um, Law Day was, uh, uh, was born in the 1950s, which was at the height of the Cold War. Now, a lot of you don't know what the Cold War was, but I was, a, I was in grade school in the, during the Cold War, and I think Mr. Smith will validate this. <laughs> Every public school in the country used to have a civil defense drill where when the siren went off, you jumped under your desk and you were taught how to cover your eyes so that the impending a glow from the explosion would not blind you. And we did that year after year because this Cold War was once one push of a button away from a nuclear war. And our chief antagonist in all this was the Soviet Union. And every May 1st, the Soviet Union had a grand parade with thousands of marching soldiers, scores of tanks and modern weapons, missiles, and they would parade through Red, Red Square as a sign to the world of their military might and power. The president at that time was a guy named Dwight Eisenhower. And believe it or not, he was the last president to come directly from the military to the presidency. And, and Eisenhower had led the most powerful, the most powerful military force the world had ever seen to liberate Europe. And he was put under great pressure to demonstrate, hey, they have theirs, let's show them ours. Let's show them how powerful we are. But Eisenhower rejected that. And he reasoned this, that they control through military might. We will celebrate May 1st, that same day that that parade is going on, with Law Day. We will show that we are ruled by the rule of law and not by soldiers and tanks. And he declared that in 1958 and it has been celebrated ever since. And I thank you guys for helping us remember and revere this day. Thank you so much. Uh, you may not 
not remember the Cold War, but you're probably, you're probably all Billy Joel fans. <laughs> you remember Cold War kids were hard to kill under their desks in an air raid drill? That's what he was talking about. Um, first of all, um, I would like to thank uh, Judge Fry for giving me credit that I do not deserve. Uh, you notice that I'm listed as a member of the Law Day Committee. I was an honorary member of the Law Day Committee. The other committee members did the work, um, and I congratulate them on the great work they did. I know that my colleagues are going to congratulate the students for the fine work you did, and I join that, but I'm gonna use my minute to direct, to, to make another point. Uh, I went to Loyal Sock High School, as obviously did several of you, and uh, I had a teacher there for ninth grade, 11th grade, and 12th grade by the name of Wayne Moffat. Some of you probably knew Wayne Moffat. He was brilliant. Uh, I went to Lycoming College. I had teachers at Lycoming College, one by the name of Dr. Ernest Giglio, and one by the name of uh, Dr. Michael Roskin. Between these three guys, between my age, 14 and I graduated college at age 20. Between uh, my age 14 and age 20, these three guys absolutely terrorized me so that I was shaking half the time. And it's because they understood good enough never is. That is, they understood that the path to a really fulfilling life is greatness. And the teachers and administrators and parents here have inspired you to greatness. And I wish that every parent, I wish that every teacher, I wish that every administrator understood that inspiring young people to greatness is a very, very, very high calling. I congratulate those that are here, and I wish others did the same. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, as always, Law Day, you know, catches me off guard a bit about how much, what these students are capable of, and a couple of things stand out and really impress me about it. Because I think about the topic you're given, and I think a lot of adults would be stumped they be a lot of writer's block, a lot of problems getting started, and you take this places that I can't even imagine. And I think that's just an attest a testament to who these students are and what the others have echoed, what they've been taught, what they've been modeled in front of them. It's very impressive what, you know, the concept I've heard today. And it really echoes, um, as Judge Anderson said, like what our country's about, what our state is about. And we're about a system of people, about a government for the people that's run by the people, and you echo that about how much we're supposed to be doing this. We're not supposed to have a government that's for some other function. It's really about the people. And I encourage each of you, take these ideas with you as you get older and become part of that system. I think about how um, the people in Harrisburg, we do a very hard job of creating the law. We, as in this part of the um, system, work at how that law applies to people. So really, I look at my job as how I work with people every day and how the law really impacts their lives. I encourage you to take that as you go forward in life to think about how whatever you choose to do, how it's going to impact the people in, your, in their lives. So, very impressed where you're at right now. So you're really well beyond where I think I would have ever thought of in your age. Just a few last words. Um, unlike my colleagues, I've been around for a long time. Judge Anderson's been around for a fair <laughs> amount of time, but this is my 27th year of doing this job. And I feel when I see Emma Strickland that I've seen her grow up through Law Day. <laughs> I've seen a number of participants go on and hear about them to go on to some really awesome things that don't necessarily have to relate to the law, but they relate to being a concerned and interested citizen. And um, just as Judge Carlucci talked about, that's in large part to those that are surrounding those in the, the children, the youth. Their parents, their educators, their extended family. And I think that um, 
it, as, as he even said, that you, I, I, I think you're an overlooked group of people that main, that contributes so much to the success of the individual students. And then I also wanted to just say a quick, um, make a quick statement to the students. I try to listen to every essay and look at every, sometimes it's more difficult to see what's being presented than in other years. And I think one year we got really sort of annoyed because we couldn't see what the art was being presented. But in each of your presentations, whether it was the Instagram post or the essays, it presents a new perspective on an old issue that is someone who does my job and has done it for a long time gives me pause to think, you know, I never looked at it that way. And to think that a middle schooler has seen something that I haven't seen makes me think I'm not getting old because I'm listening and I'm still willing to learn. And that's just something that I would encourage everybody to be willing to do is to learn. And just because you finish school doesn't mean you finish learning. And just because you're in middle school doesn't mean you can't teach someone who's gone to a lot of school just a little bit more. So thank you all very much for your participation here. And I just personally want to thank all of the judges and the attorneys, and especially MBJ Fry for the work that he has done over the years, along with Michelle, in making this event such a memorable occasion. So thank you all very much. In closing, just a couple of, of brief items. One, uh, for the winners, uh, if you would hang out for a minute, uh, I think that uh, Michelle or others will want to get a photo, um, or a group photo, perhaps with uh, some of the judges, if they stick around. Um, also, uh, there will be a reception in the jurors lounge, which is on this floor, just down the hallway here, um, for the winners and their families and teachers. Uh, there'll be some refreshments and things like that, so please uh, take advantage of that. And for um, the uh, LLA members, um, we'll also be meeting at the James afterwards. So uh, we'll invite you to that as well. We're going to eat Isabella's. <laughs> I think that's going to happen. I, I suspect. It, oh, we'll take it over to the jurors' lounge. <laughs> we know where Judge Anderson will be. <laughs> All right. With that, um, I think we'll close today's ceremony. Thank you very much uh, for being here. And as always, um, we really appreciate uh, everybody's participation. Thank you.